Oh, Starship Troopers. Honestly, a series that I enjoy in spite of itself. I've talked about my love for the 90s Verhoeven film before, back in the G Savior video, I think, but it wasn't until earlier this year that I found out that the series had an earlier adaptation by Sunrise, with mecha designs by Studio New, the minds behind the Macross series, and interesting source material to pull from, I was immediately interested. However, there is one tiny barrier of entry for the Starship Troopers OVA, and that is the fact that the only home video release is a Japanese laser dick, laser dick? Japanese laser disc with no subtitle track. Now, there are people out there that have apparently upscaled this release digitally somehow, then like put it on a Blu-ray and are selling it on eBay. And I don't know how legal that is, but hey, I can't throw stones because I relied on a fan sub release to watch this one. Thanks, Internet Archive. Sometimes you really are the equivalent of finding bootleg anime DVDs at a shady flea market, and there ain't nothing wrong with that. Seriously though, this series is the equivalent of Abandonware, and I don't think Sunrise is ever going to re-release or translate it. Hell, I doubt if anyone working there knows it exists. So if you're interested in watching this, you can thank the valiant efforts of online anime fan subbers everywhere. Also, just to get it out of the way, I have not read the original Starship Troopers novel by Robert Heinlein, but Yes, I know that the movie is a satire of the ideas expressed in the novel, and this OVA is more of a straight adaptation. While Heinlein's politics and philosophies are often a point of discussion with people saying he's anything from a libertarian to a fascist, uh, I'm not going to discuss that here because I have a very surface level understanding of the politics that are presented in the book, and I'm more interested in how this anime adapted the story in a more broad sense. Spoiler alert, uh, the OVA barely touches on the politics of the world anyway. The Starship Troopers OVA opens with the one thing that I really wish the 90s movie could have had, power armor. While the Marauder power suit and its variants were originally planned to be in the film, the budget thought otherwise. But the OVA has it in spades, in fact you almost never see the soldiers do anything without it in this show. I really like the look of these things, especially when the main cast graduates out of the brightly colored training suits and into the drab colors of the mobile infantry. The suits are bulky and powerful, with enough force in their thrusters to allow a soldier to jump over a building. Plus, the helmets look incredibly similar to the Mark V Mjolnir helmets worn by the Spartans in Halo, and that's just good design sense right there. Just like that sci-fi property that would come a little over 10 years later, Starship Troopers opening features armored super soldiers blasting away on a battlefield to an awesome guitar riff. Then there's an 80s power ballad opening, so this show is definitely starting out strong. Our main character, Johnny Rico, is playing in a high school football game and he has a big crush on a fellow classmate named Carmen Sita. He decides to profess his love to her after he wins the big game, but unfortunately he eats dirt and they lose. Johnny's friend Carl tries to cheer him up, and they all get drunk at an after party and then take a drive out to the sea. How responsible of them. Johnny starts spilling his guts to Carl, saying that he's jealous of his friend's life goals. See, Johnny's father owns a shipping company and they're quite well off, but the prospect of going to business school and taking over has never really appealed to him. Rico is portrayed as not wanting to settle down and live a simple life. I mean, it's understandable, he's a teenager and still sees life as a grand adventure, so staying in the same town and doing the same thing is not appealing. He ruminates on this in the backseat of the car until he falls asleep. That or he has a concussion from that tackle. Uh, someone should probably check on him. Luckily, the person that does check on him is none other than Carmen Sita. 
She talks to him and mentions that she's going to join the Navy and become a pilot. Of course, this causes Johnny to immediately decide that he's going to join the military as well. It's not just his love for Carmen Sita that makes him want to join the army, because he gets even more enthusiastic after his friend Carl shows him the footage of the battle from the opening. Carl is a space camera hacker, I guess. It's really not explained, and more importantly, they watch it in Johnny's Hey Arnold ass looking bedroom. While Johnny's father takes the news well, mostly just asking him if he's really thought about what his duty as a soldier could mean, his mother on the other hand takes it a little less well, in fact she slaps him and doesn't go with his father to see Johnny off. As fate would have it, right after Johnny enlists, the Federation announces that there have been attacks in the outer colonies and he's transferred into the mobile infantry, a branch he knows only one thing about. It is the worst that there is. Johnny is put through training by a stern sergeant named Zim whose favorite thing to do is beat people up and call them scumbags. After hand-to-hand -hand combat training, he does tell them to go to the dispensary. Now that's my kind of army. Johnny quickly meets his squad mates, Smith, Hendrick, Pat, and Azuma. A lot of this adaptation focuses on the relationship between Rico and the rest of his squad, which is also a large theme in the book, as the camaraderie that one finds in the armed forces becomes a second family. Honestly, not a bad thing for Johnny, because right as he and his squad start training in their armored battle suits, he loses a member of his blood family. During the intro of this episode, we get to see a glimpse of the OVA version of Starship Troopers Aliens. Here they take the form of these amorphous flesh blobs a lot of the time, usually with big bulbous eyes or beaks protruding from their bubblegum hued skin. They're able to sneak onto Earth aboard a transport shuttle and attack the spaceport in New Buenos Aires. Johnny's mother was there picking up her sister after a long trip and was caught in the attack. Kinda sucks that the last thing you did with your son before you died was slap him, but oh well. At least there's rad synth music. Johnny! Meanwhile, Johnny and the squad have little time to adjust to their new power armor before they are required to assist local authorities in putting out a huge fire. While they're fighting the fire, Hendrick completely freezes up, and while Rico is successful at gaining control of his armor and even rescuing a civilian, all he gets for his trouble is a punch in the face for disobeying orders. Hendrick decides to quit, saying that the mobile infantry isn't for him, and leaves the rest of the squad wondering if he had the right idea. While Hendrick barely got any characterization in the one episode he's featured in, at least the rest of the squad all have some unique traits. Smith is the group's bad boy hothead that has an earring and initially doesn't get along with Johnny. However, the two eventually grow to have the strongest friendship in the whole squad. Azuma is the smallest of the crew and is always listening to music on his headphones. His constant joking and lackadaisical attitude cover up his true feelings of being absolutely terrified of dying and just being a soldier in general. Pat is the big guy in the group that has an older girlfriend with a big schnoz and that's kinda it. Oh, and there's this guy named Greg who gets one cool moment later but 90% of the time I thought he was a background extra. While all these character traits are simple and tropey, they work well enough for a six episode OVA. Along with the story of the mobile infantry platoon, I also enjoy the designs of the ships and powered armor. I said before that the armor had a very Master Chief-like helmet, but unlike the super soldiers from Halo, the mobile infantry suits are much bulkier and feature large thrusters. They also climb into the suits instead of putting them on like armor, so it's got that bottoms vibe to it. You know, it actually kind of also reminds me of how they did the power armor in Fallout 4. It's basically a small vehicle instead of a suit of armor, and it's a concept that I think is really cool. Rico's class, I can't do it anymore, I'm, I'm calling him Rico now, heads to the moon for some low gravity space training. 
He gets pretty excited to see that Carmen Sita is also headed to the moon with her Navy class, and he lusts over her while boarding the flight. On the way there, they're told that the leader of the Federation is going to announce a state of emergency and are shown footage of the attack on Buenos Aires. Over a million people are reported to be dead or missing, but Rico, perhaps out of a youthful sense of invulnerability, doesn't really give it too much thought. We get a pretty fun scene where Rico and the squad are practicing combat drops by jumping off of a tower on the moon in their armor. The armor is shown to be fairly unwieldy when piloted by amateurs and amplifies a soldier's movements and strength many times over. This also means that the slightest movements can send a soldier flying off by accident, which is even more dangerous on the moon. One wrong move and you're just another orbiting piece of space junk. We stick with the squad for a while while they go through training on the moon, but they also have time to go to the local spaceport mall. Unfortunately for Rico, he bumps into Carmen Sita at the exact same time that Pat wants to show him a nude Polaroid of his old girlfriend, which causes Carmen to get upset and slap him. Rico finally gets a letter from home that informs him of his mother's death, and he becomes so distracted during training that his whole squad is destroyed and they have to go clean bathrooms as a punishment. During their custodial punishment, Pat and Smith confront Rico and they punch him a few times. Greg saw Rico read his letter and explains what happened to Rico's mom, which leads Smith to give a speech about how no matter who's dead, they all have to be a team. Rico being distracted as the squad leader will literally get them all killed, and Rico seems to take that advice to heart, using his camaraderie with his squad mates to ease his pain. So now that Rico and his squad can at least move in their power armor, their next task is to take part in war games on Mars. This episode has a pretty good setup with the soldiers being divided into red and blue teams to play a very violent match of Capture the Flag. However, one thing that they don't know is that the Martian supply base that they're supposed to use as a resupply point and neutral zone has been attacked and taken over by alien enemies. Sergeant Zim can't raise the base on comms and wants to cancel the exercise, but his superiors tell him that they won't delay training due to a simple communication issue because, you know, that's smart. Zim doesn't like being waved off, so he orders his comm officer to request the regular mobile infantry to inspect the base, saying that he'll take responsibility if anyone in command gets pissed off about it. Rico and his squad are running low on their training rounds, which are basically big paintballs, so they head to the base to refill their ammo. Of course, once they get there, they find a red team soldier slumped against the wall dead. They report him to Zim, who tells them to find proof of the alien attack and report back, saying that the regular troops will be there soon. The squad ventures deeper into the base, eventually finding a lot of dead soldiers and are attacked by the monstrous squid-like aliens. We finally get to see them for more than a few seconds, and while I am partial to the bugs from the movie, the weird flesh-like look of these aliens is cool too. They also fire these lasers right out of their body and it gives them an almost biomechanical feel. When they took over the ship at the beginning of the episode, it almost seemed like some sort of infection. And it appears that their biomass can survive space and is even capable of space travel to some capacity. My mind immediately goes to the Tyranids from Warhammer and subsequently the Zerg from Starcraft since they're basically the same thing. The thought of a living ship floating through space like some ancient galactic terror is so awesome. If you know any other books or anything that has that type of alien threat, please let me know because I think that's really cool. Zim finally announces over the general radio channel that the simulation is being called off, and he tells Rico and the squad to pull back. While they're leaving the base, Rico is caught by one of the aliens, prompting Greg to turn back and save him. Greg is shot by the alien mine lasers and cut cleanly in half. Rico tries to get away using the brief window that Greg's life bought him, and is luckily saved by the arrival of the mobile infantry troopers in their fully decked out power armor. 
The troopers proceed to destroy the aliens, and when we catch back up with the squad, it's revealed that Greg will be denied an honorable burial, as he died in direct violation of his orders to retreat. Rico takes it upon himself as the squad leader to gather Greg's things, finding a letter that Greg had been writing to his girlfriend before they left for the war games. Rico takes the letter and promises to remember Greg and honor him, even if no one else will. We then jump ahead six months as Rico's class graduates from basic training. Rico has a few days of leave before he'll find out what his assignment is and uses it to visit his mother's grave, bidding his father farewell in a somber and respectful goodbye. He and Smith travel together to find Julie, Greg's girlfriend, and Smith becomes enraged when they find her literally on her wedding day getting married to another man. How unlucky can these guys be, really? Rico and Smith both feel pissed off and depressed at the same time, so they go to a dive bar for a drink. Not long after, a bunch of thugs come in, and they end up getting into a brawl in the parking lot, where the two mobile infantrymen proceed to beat the living shit out of like eight guys. The cops arrive and are basically like, good job boys, we'll take it from here, telling them that they can walk to the nearby city to catch transport back to base. Smith and Rico walk off down the moonlit road, drinking beers to an awesome 80s power ballad. What better night could you have with one of your bros? Honestly though, I really like this scene as it's almost wistful and nostalgic. The way the music blends with the nighttime scenery, it's like I can smell the grass and cheap beer, you know? I also think this scene is a really great way to show how Rico has found his place with his new family in the infantry. Rico's been through a hell of a lot for a guy who just graduated high school. His mother's death and the death of Greg, a man who saved his life, must weigh heavily upon Rico's soul. But his camaraderie with the other members of his squad, and admittedly his hatred for the alien threat, keep him going. I do think it's interesting that Rico's anger at the aliens is pretty understated in this show. It's something I would have thought would be played up a lot more. Rico and the rest of his squad are assigned to a battalion called Willie's Wildcats. Because they have reduced numbers, a new squad member is added, a big guy named Cherenkov. At first, the guys are suspicious of him and treat him as an outsider, or with complete hostility. He gets off on the wrong foot with them by stepping on Ozima's Lucky Charm, which is a bumper sticker that he wants to slap on his power armor. Sharonkov just sort of gives it back and walks off, and the guy is super quiet and awkward. Later on, the guys get in a fight with some navy dudes at a bar, and after Sharonkov fights with them, they start to respect him. Rico is living sort of high on life as he receives a note from Carmen that apologizes for being mad at him and includes a picture of her in a swimsuit. But, like Whiplash, Starship Troopers immediately informs Rico that the Starship Saratoga was destroyed by alien forces, and that was the ship Carmen had just been assigned to the day before. Rico's battalion are rerouted to directly combat the aliens and were treated to footage of the attack on the Saratoga. I like how the aliens float through space in this weird bubble form. It really is, for lack of a better word, alien. Military intelligence has located a world with a large population of the aliens and have decided to destroy them. The rest of this episode mostly features combat on this barren landscape against the fleshy creatures. Cherenkov is huge in his power armor and he also has a giant machine gun. Eventually, the mobile infantry find the alien's base, which is literally just a hole in the ground filled with the alien biomass. We do get one singular moment where Azuma and Rico kill an alien, and Azuma sort of freaks out, saying that the aliens are living beings that they're just killing. But the dying alien promptly blows up and kills Azuma, with Rico being thrown backwards so hard that he has flashbacks of his family. The rest of the recruit squad rush in and save the sergeant, with the alien mass getting larger and larger. Finally, Rico shoots it with a flamethrower, desperate to finally end the battle. However, he is struck and everything goes white. Suddenly, Rico wakes up aboard a medical ship and sees that Carmen is still alive. He rushes to her, no longer afraid of his true feelings, and just as he is about to confess his love, 
The show cuts to credits, and the OVA adaptation of Starship Troopers comes to an abrupt ending. The OVA of Starship Troopers is definitely a strange but charming relic of the 1980s. While it didn't blow my mind or anything, it has enough going for it that I found my watch through to be pretty enjoyable. The show does not have very good animation, and some of the characters look a little off, I guess, but sometimes things are more than the sum of their parts. What the show lacks in dynamic movement and fluid action, it makes up for in beautiful colors and still shots of ships that I want on my wall as a print. Not to mention, the 80s power metal and synth soundtrack can only be described in one word. Rad. I suppose what I'm saying is that this one kinda gets by on vibes alone. While we do follow a loose character arc of Rico growing up a bit and confessing his feelings to Carmen, most of that is in the background and doesn't make for a very good emotional high note to end on. As a show, Starship Troopers is pretty middle of the road, but as a piece of 80s nostalgia, it's upper tier for sure. My biggest complaint is that for all the buildup of camaraderie between the squad and all they go through, the show just sorta ends, just like this video. Hey everyone, welcome to today's end card. Let's get the channel members thanked, aka Batosai, Argon Griever, Asher Kazar, Brian Sanchez, D Mels, Daniel Johnson, Detter V, Dilla Soul 22, Gert! Joe Castellanos, Joe Cavazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean Nugent, Mr. Smash, Zappa Slaves Video Gamer 75, Jesus, I oh, messed that one up, Trey Hardy, Sindustries, and Harmonious. Thank you all so much for being channel members. I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this shorter video. Like, for once, I actually put out a video that was shorter than 45 goddamn minutes, which, uh, it felt, uh, it felt nice if I'm being honest. So, uh, what can you expect to see from this channel in the upcoming month of April? Well, there is no April Fool's video. I did not have time. But, uh, coming up next, we have, I think, a video game-based video, uh, which, is, which is released uh, next in the schedule. And then afterwards, we have a, um, a full retrospective on a 50-episode 80s mech anime, which I don't think I've said publicly what it is yet, so that'll be a surprise. And then after that, I want to do at least three videos in April, so I, at the end of April, I think that we're going to have the Reconquista in G video out, and we can get that one out of the way. I know everyone wants me to talk about that one, because it's like the weird one <laughs> that everyone is kind of hostile towards, I think? I don't know, I've only watched the first episode, I, I have no opinion yet. It seems weird. But uh, it is what it is. Other than that, what am I doing? Uh, you can go on over to the gaming channel where I've just finished up a playthrough of Dragon Ball Z Budokai and replaced it with... I I'm playing the first Sly Cooper game, which I've never played before in my whole life. So I'm playing through that, and that's an experience. If you like Sly Cooper as a kid, uh, you can come watch me play that on my gaming channel, which will be in the description. Other than that, we're also playing through Kingdom Hearts. Uh, Kingdom Hearts won the Final Mix version because I thought that would be fun to play through. And the new plan for that channel is to put Let's Play videos up there and then use the footage for video game retrospectives here because I really like making the video game videos. They are a good break from the anime stuff and uh, they let me be a little bit more creative with my structure, so that's fun. So I, I want to do, I have only done like one a year the past three years, so I want to do more than one. I, I want to do a Sly Cooper video. I want to do a DBZ Budokai video. I'd love to do a Ratchet and Clank video, and I, I would love to get all those videos out for everybody who, who wants to see it. I think there was a poll a long time ago where people said they wanted me to talk about Ratchet and Clank, so... Anyway, thank you for uh, watching this extra long end card. I hope you enjoyed today's video talking about Starship Troopers, the OVA from 1988. And we will see you again soon with, uh, well, maybe with something a little different.